from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Generative AI enthusiasm has lately turned into AI skepticism. The lack of clarity on tangible ROI, a narrow list of early winners like NVIDIA and a few others, and relentless vendor marketing around AI has caused cynicism and some media backlash. But the reality remains that we have entered a new era in technology innovation that has a very high probability of transforming industries, public policy, company leadership, and the related fortunes of individuals and organizations. Moreover, 97% of leading Gen AI adopters report that they're achieving tangible benefits from Gen AI. Adoption is relentlessly on the rise and nearly two years in is poised to begin throwing off enough cash that will further heighten the mandate to apply AI to drive business results. As such, we believe that as we exit Q4 into 2025, the demand for AI solutions will continue to occupy the headspace of business technology pros. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we highlight fresh data from the latest ETR drill down survey on generative AI to look at the adoption rates, the production use cases, ROI expectations, the benefits that organizations are realizing and current spending patterns. Now the media is accentuating the lack of clear ROI. Barely a day goes by where you don't see some type of negative article on AI ROI, references to Gartner's trough of disillusionment and the like from the Wall Street Journal to the Register to trade publications and TV programs. The narrative is decidedly downbeat when it comes to AI ROI. But the latest, the last headline in the lower left of this slide is instructive. While AI ROI may be elusive for many organizations, enthusiasm that the bubble will continue persists. Now today we unpack the most recent Gen AI survey from ETR's latest drill down. This is fresh data from nearly 1800 IT decision makers, we call them ITDMs, across industries and company sizes. Now it's weighted toward larger spenders in North America, Okay, with a nice mix, however, of C-level executives, middle managers, and practitioners. Now, the first set of data we look at shows that while there are still some holdouts, the vast majority of respondents, they're leaning in to Gen AI. Notice the steep decline in those firms that have not evaluated Gen AI. As, as you recall, in the summer of last year, uh, we, we were struck that one third of the survey base was not evaluating Gen AI. And the reason they gave us was that AI was too risky, they felt, Gen, Gen AI specifically, and or it was moving too fast and they were concerned about compliance and regulatory control and legal issues. Well, that figure, look, it is down to 13% of the respondents after a steep downward trajectory. A full 84% of respondents have clarity on at least one use case that they're contemplating. And this is relevant because organizations told us a year ago that they were inundated with use cases and they had to go through a prioritization exercise and pare down the many ideas that were flowing in from the lines of business. The point is today we're seeing much more clarity from organizations and that bodes well in our view for ROI, which we're going to explore a little bit later in this episode. But first let's double click on use cases and zoom in on those that are actually in production. Now, many pundits have called 2023 the year of experimentation, and that was largely true. You can see here on the leftmost bars that, that dark blue, that's the July survey, and only 25% of the respondents weren't at that time in production. So to review from the previous chart, about 85% of customers we see leaning into Gen AI and this data shows that nearly 75% have at least one use case in production. Now in that red text, we show which use cases are the most popular. Text and data summarization at 31% uh, of the respondents citing that. Collaboration is at 28%. Sales and marketing content development and copy, uh, and as well as code generation, they're next, and you can see goes down the list. But very few respondents say they don't know. 
Now, these use cases, yeah, they're pretty straightforward. And some of the other higher net present value use cases are in that small other category in that low single digit. So look, these are not earth shattering use cases by any means, but they're becoming more widespread, which brings us to the ROI question. You know, does it matter that these examples are what we sometimes call chatty, meaning they're chat GPT like? Well, from an ROI perspective, no, not in our view anyway. This chart shows how the ROI expectations have admittedly pushed to the right, now 21% saying the break even will be more than one year out, up from 13% in the April survey earlier this year. So while here we see an indication of uncertainty with 21 plus 23 or 44% saying either more than a year to get ROI or we're not sure, indicating you know some fuzziness. Nonetheless, a full 56% say inside of 12 months, which is encouraging, despite the fact that customers are being more cautious about ROI, at least signing up for faster ROIs. Look, that's the nature of these new waves. When the surf's up, like it is now, you gotta grab your board and see which waves look most, most promising. You just gotta get out there because your competitors are out there competing for the best rides. And as Pat Gelsinger famously said in the Cube, if you're not riding the waves, you're gonna end up as driftwood. Let's keep digging into the ROI question and look at how ITDMs see the benefits, the actual tangible benefits of deploying Gen AI. 98% of the respondents in, this, that, in that previous chart answered this current question, i.e., what benefits are you seeing? Yeah. Specifically, 77% said increased productivity and better efficiency. 39% said better customer support. Contact centers, by the way, is a big initial use case. I call it the VDI of Gen AI. Remember, VDI was always the low-hanging fruit of consolidations with things like hyperconverged infrastructure. Not that exciting, but practical. <laughs> and you can see other the other benefits that customers cite, like better engagement with customers, product innovation, better data analysis, because people start by getting their data in order. So there's some uh, residual benefits there. Headcount savings, one-third said basic labor reduction. So that's a big number that we felt was worth highlighting in the red. And then technology savings, et cetera. But only 3% said none of the above. So clearly, most customers deploying Gen AI, they're seeing the benefits. And when you drill further into the data and look at the bellwether industries and leading cohorts like financial services, check it out. Here we show 152 respondents in financial services and the percent citing productivity improvements jumps to 84%, with 50% seeing improvements in customer support and only 1% saying none of the above. And the reason this is important is that over the course of IT history, financial services has often been the leading, or at least a leading adopter of the latest and greatest technologies. Now, they were a little bit slower, as we know, with the cloud, but that was a matter of both trust and cloud maturity. Whereas financials can exercise this time around better control in this cycle, whether doing so in the cloud with VPCs or doing so on-prem. Now, it's also important to ground this data in reality. Remember, ROI technically is a ratio of benefit over cost. Really, break-even period refers to the time it takes to recoup your initial investment. Net present value, value, or NPV, is the discounted cash flow of an initiative over a time period. It reflects the actual dollar value of an investment. The point is, when you look at an investment, it's important to evaluate the amount of money invested, as we show here. Mm -hmm. and ETR asked respondents to quantify their Gen AI spend, and you can see most firms are spending less than $100,000 annually. And about half the survey spends less than a half uh, half a million, $500,000. And the reason this is relevant is because if you can lower the spend, you're naturally going to increase the percent ROI. Lower the denominator, the result goes up. But this gives no indication of the time frame to get to cash flow positive. That was the earlier sort of implication of one of the earlier charts. Time it takes to get to cash flow positive. And very importantly, no indication of the size of the benefit. 
And as you can see here, about 30% of this survey base spends more than $500,000 per annum, and 23% spend north of a million dollars annually, with nearly 10% spending $10 million, eight figures or more this year. The point is firms are spending. We know that around 45% of the companies we talk to are stealing from other budgets to fund Gen AI. <laughs> now in financial services, around 20% of the respondents are spending more than $5 million this year. And the big spenders are getting really serious. 26% of the global 2000 are spending more than $5 million this year from this survey. And these firms, they might see a smaller ROI percentage because the denominator is going up, but they'll likely see bigger NPVs. And they will set the pace for future investments. It may take longer to get those paybacks, but the numbers are going to start to get big, we think especially as and if these investments start to throw off cash and enable gain sharing and reinvestment. Now, the other thing to remember is that Gen AI specifically and AI generally will become ubiquitous and embedded in virtually the entire tech stack. The tech industry is embedding AI throughout their stacks. So as AI becomes less visible, it will begin to drive new levels of productivity. That's our prediction anyway. And it's been a while since we've seen a long sustained period of above average productivity growth. Here's a BLS chart that shows the five-year moving average of annual productivity growth over six to seven decades. Now, the 50s and 60s saw consumer spending become a dominant driver of productivity growth, coming as the post-World War II industrial economy really kicked in. But for the better part of the 70s and 80s, we saw generally below average productivity growth until the PC revolution kicked in and put a computer at everybody's fingertips. Then after the dot-com boom and bust, we saw productivity growth bottom. Financial crisis of the mid-2000s, the 2008 timeframe. And then a long sustained but slow rebound to just above the post-World War II average. So while it was, while it was on an uptick, it really was just climbing back to that, to that average. But this was largely false momentum driven by the recovery versus a major technological wave. The promise of Gen AI, specifically in Gen AI overall, is that we'll boost productivity growth by a meaningful amount. Eric Brynjolfsson, the MIT and I guess now Stanford professor, said last year he'd be disappointed if we don't see a 3 to 4% increase in productivity. He said this at a UiPath conference in 2023 which that would be noticeable on the previous diagram. That's the hope for the technology industry to address many of the world's challenges, including things like massive debt, climate change, poverty, overpopulation, terminal diseases, and the like. Now, our industry has made many promises in the past, and some have failed to deliver. But in the grand scheme of things, the technology industry has a pretty good track record of delivering societal value. In the near term, here are some of the things that we're watching as indicators of progress in the AI ROI discussion. The use of private data, training and tuning LLMs, Gen AI uh, specifically. We talked about this a lot with the Gen AI power law, that there's a long tail of use cases and applications and domain-specific models. We're starting to see a lot more discussion around that and a lot more application of that. We've seen uh, smaller models you know, hit the market open source models and, and proprietary data becoming the really the new watchword here where companies can gain significant competitive advantage with their own data. Next, RAG adoption. In July, only 7% of the customers that ETR surveyed were deploying RAG. That was a surprisingly low figure. Now, you know, RAG maybe doesn't set the world on fire, but it does start to set the base. A lot of the experimentation that is being done is being done with RAG. And those will go, those, those systems, those, those solutions will go into production uh, in the near future and actually drive some productivity. We're also watching spending levels, particularly watch the denominator. The, if the, when the denominator is small, you have actually you have big ROIs. It would be triple digits. Uh, again, benefit over cost. But we're expecting bigger denominators. It might take longer to deliver break even, but they'll give higher NPVs and those higher NPVs are gonna be uh, serve as a, a beacon 
of the potential for Gen AI, it will also throw off cash and allow that gain sharing that we talked about earlier. Let's think about use cases beyond those that are quote unquote chatty, drug discovery, novel climate solutions, like, you know, maybe reducing carbon's not the answer. Maybe the AI will help us figure out ways to take carbon out of the atmosphere, as an example. New energy solutions to power AI, maybe let, let, let AI bloom and let AI help figure out how to uh, uh, identify you know, better energy solutions. Cures for terminal diseases, you know, solutions for world hunger and poverty. Also, there'll be new military technologies for sure, uh, the form of drones and other intelligent devices and capabilities, not to mention cybersecurity. We're also watching the rise of agents. This has become the hot new buzzword beyond single co-pilots. Single agents yeah, really aren't that interesting. Uh, but when you start to apply multiple agents that can learn from reasoning traces of humans and connect and, 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 and absorb data from back-end systems and be guided by top-down metrics of an organization, this is going to be a signal for real productivity boosts. We're talking here about true end-to-end -end automation and the emergence of what we sometimes call AI-native companies dramatically change the way in which organizations operate with new workflows that are that require one tenth of the people to do today's workflows and can do, do so much, much faster. What about it? Are you an optimist or a skeptic on AI ROI? What are you seeing in your organization and how do you think 2025 will play out? As always, let us know. Okay. That's it for now. Thanks to Alex Myerson and Ken Schiffman on production and in our podcast. And Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hoth, that was Rob Hoth, is our EIC over at SiliconAngle.com. Thank you all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and SiliconAngle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at SiliconAngle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn posts. And please check out etr.ai. They've got the best and most consistent and ongoing great survey data focused on the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.